All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the first installment of Sounds Like Kaidan Time. Um, this is a new show uh, I decided to put together um, in my spare time. Uh, basically, what I'm going to be doing is playing all these kind of old uh, Japanese, what they call sound novels, which is, uh, I'm kind of, I'm checking the stream at the same time, so I'm kind of checking my screen, it's kind of difficult to get used to, it should be cool. Um, sound novels. Um, how do I explain sound novels? Um, let's go back a bit. This this show, the name of the show is Sounds Like Kaidan Time. Some of you might have heard the, the word kaidan before. Some might not have. Um, <clears throat> the word kaidan just pretty much means ghost story in Japanese. But it's kind of that sort of special flavor of ghost story uh, that uh, exists in Japan. <clears throat> sort of usually got to do with like, well, it used to have a lot to do with um, sort of mythology and that sort of like folklore and, and that kind of thing. Lots of what they call yokai, that the um, type of Japanese spirits that stories of which have been passed down um, for many hundreds of years. So generally stories that involve those kind of mythical beings. Um, things like that. I think like nowadays the term kaidan just kind of applies to all spooky stories in general. So yeah, basically this is, this is a show where we uh, enjoy um, a trip through uh, these sound novels, which, which kind of in, in like a, a really uh, in a, in a brief way of explaining it, it's, it's sort of like, um, throughout the 90s, there was kind of a boom with, uh, well, video games, of course. There was a huge kind of um, influx of, of uh, video games on the PlayStation 1 and um, Nintendo 64. And there was kind of this format that was developed as, as kind of like a game format, um, which is basically like a novel um, in that like there's basically all you see on the screen is like text. Text kind of covers the screen and... The, there's kind of some backgrounds that happen behind the text, like f photographs and sort of some odd CG and that kind of thing sometimes. And uh, the idea is to kind of like, it's like a novel plus sound, uh, as the uh, the term implies. So you're kind of, you, you sort of read through this, this kind of story, but, you know, w with each kind of like section of the text that goes through, like the you know the sound effects and some, some music and um so yeah and then like that that's that was sort of uh um there's a lot of those that were made in uh in the early 90s um and uh yeah i'll get to, i'll get to that a little bit later i think um so basically <clears throat> um i was thinking about starting some kind of a streaming thing but i didn't really know what to do <laughs> Uh, I was going to stream some music and, and that kind of thing, but it was too difficult to set up. I might sort it out sometime in the future, but um, yeah, so I kind of wanted to do something with like reading or something like that. I've always sort of wanted to do some kind of um, reading thing, but I was never sure if anyone would ever take any interest in that, <laughs> anything like that. So, um, so I decided to try doing this to put my translation skills to the test and also just because I enjoy these sort of kind of uh, oddities I guess you call them there's sort of this whole kind of genre of sound novel is sort of a weird world like it was uh, it was really popular like in Japan I think um, but not for very long I think uh, the, it's sort of they kind of evolved like sound the early sound novels are pretty much just like text and and you know um, sound effects and some music and that kind of thing but they they did kind of evolve to become visual novels which is where they kind of had full-on you know characters and worlds were all kind of like created hand-drawn and um, it was a lot more fleshed out visually 
Um, but uh, yeah, and so so visual novels like now are still really really popular, especially like over, overseas. Like visual novels were sort of um, uh, you know well have been big in Japan for a long time, probably around the time that sound novels came into uh, existence. And uh, yeah, now I guess I mean I I kind of to be honest I don't know a whole lot about visual novels, but um, I think even in the West, like there's a lot. There are a lot now that are, are being developed in the West, like as a legitimate um, game genre, and uh, yeah, they're kind of everybody sort of um, using using that style of, of game as as a really interesting medium for for game expression and that kind of thing, um, which is great. So I thought um, we'd kind of return to uh, this weird world of, of sound novels because they really are interesting and and weird, and the stories in them are, are pretty deep and. Um, it's it's a real journey and and i think uh you know a lot of them have uh like multiple choices and it's sort of like a choose your own adventure kind of vibe um so yeah we can kind of have fun together um thinking about which path to take and uh so because the, these kind of strange uh japanese sound novels were obviously never really officially translated and brought to the west because they're so they're very kind of um stereotypically japanese i think as you'll find um so i think yeah there's a lot of uh, they just don't really get a lot of coverage overseas i think there are a lot of kind of some of the bigger games like there are there have been some like fan translations and that kind of thing um but uh yeah uh, i i don't know i i um I think a lot of fan translations are really good, but but sometimes they're a bit questionable, to be honest. And uh, yeah. Um, anyway, so yeah, I thought this could be a cool thing to do. Um, use use my Japanese skills to translate these on the fly, make it a bit interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is the vibe. This is sounds like kaidan time. Um, sounds like. Uh, obviously referring to the sound novel concept and kaidan a lot of these sound novels were, were essentially ghost stories so they were kind of like a lot of them were horror themed um if they weren't horror themed like there were a lot of sort of suspense stories and thrillers and that kind of thing um yeah and then i think there was the whole there was another kind of subgenre which sort of branched into romance and you know the whole kind of that that area which is you know i'm not going to touch that but uh yeah <clears throat> obviously like when you're reading a scary novel uh adding the element of sound really kind of <clears throat> adds a whole extra um l layer of depth to it so that's why i like these things it's sort of it's like reading a book but you kind of have this interesting uh like you know sound design and and the music and that kind of thing it's a bit it's a bit wonky but that kind of you know to me that sort of adds to the experience it's um it's just a lot of fun. And uh, <clears throat> so, um, I don't know how many of these I'll do. I'll probably do a lot. Um, if I kind of get busy in, in my real life, um, it might kind of drop off a bit. But I thought I'd start this show with uh, one of the more well-known sound novels of the period. This is a work uh, for the PlayStation 1 called... Kamaitachi no Yoru. And this is by, this is developed by a company called Chunsoft, um, which actually coined the term sound novel. So they're the kind of, they're the sound novel OGs. Um, they later joined with a company called Spike, and now they're Spike Chunsoft, and they still kind of make a lot of really good games, a lot of visual novels. Um, but yeah, they I think they, they, I think they patented the term sound novel. And so, <clears throat> this this game Kamae Tachi no Yoru is uh, the second of their sound novel releases, and actually the full title of it is, I think it's it's Sound. What's it called? Sound Evolution. No, Sound Novel Evolution Two, Kamae Tachi no Yoru. And this is Tokubetsu Hen. So it's a really long title, but basically the, it, it's um, yeah they had the series called Sound Novel Evolution because it was pretty cutting edge at the time i think well they wanted to make it seem like it was cutting edge <clears throat> and um there was so there was sound novel evolution one um and the reason why i picked this one 
uh, is because this kind of has a bit of a cult following. It's pretty well known, uh, especially in Japan, uh, for you know the 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 dudes that know about this whole world. Um, but uh, also, this was translated, I believe, like officially. That it was it has like an official release. Um, it it kind of it was re released on several sort of you know uh, contemporary consoles. Like I think it had a PS2 release and um, you know PC and. I believe the English release can you can get it on a few different consoles like maybe Vita and that kind of thing, but um, <clears throat> yeah, I, did, I did, yeah, I'm not going to do the English translation because that's no fun. We want to do the original, the uh, the OG uh, sound novel Kamae Tachi no Yoru. Um, this this is I'm playing the PS1 version, but the original original was I believe released in 1994 on the Super Nintendo. And, and this was kind of revamped for the PS1. So the graphics are a bit more smoother and it's a bit more detailed. There's some more kind of special effects going on. And they, they've kind of added a few sort of um, user intuitive tweaks. Like, um, yeah, yeah, as you'll see once we get into it. Um, yeah. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, so that's the reason. The, it says Tokubetsu Hen at the end. And that means special version. <laughs> So, yeah, the reason why it's a special version is because the original was on Super Nintendo, and this is, yeah, so they've made it more special. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, um, so this is, yeah, this is kind of considered a pretty good sound novel. Sound novels generally sort of have questionable quality sometimes, I think, but um, this is kind of, you know, amongst them, this is sort of one of the kings. So it, it should be pretty good. I, I played it. Um, for quite a while, years and years ago, like quite a long time ago, um, when I was still practicing my Japanese, and yeah, it's um, it's good. I didn't really didn't get through a whole lot of it, but I really enjoyed what I played, and so I'm really keen to to get into it again. I can't really remember the, the storyline and, and that kind of thing. It'll come back to me, I think. But um, so um, first of all, what will we do? I want to talk about the name of the game first. So, <clears throat> I'm right now. I'm streaming to Twitch, and uh, the um, name of like kind of the category uh, of like what what game it is. It says it's Banshee's Last Cry. So I think that's the that's kind of the uh, the name, the English localized name. Uh, of this game, but I yeah, it's a, a little bit. I don't know. <laughs> it's a, a bit of a strange name for for this game. So basically, the 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 name in Japanese is Kamai Tachi no Yoru. This means night night of the Kamai Tachi. And Kamai Tachi is. Let's have a look if I can get my brows up here. Kamai Tachi is a yokai. This um, uh, a Japanese spirit from from folklore. And it's an interesting one. Um, let's have a look here. All right, give me one second. Let's see if I can get this browser happening. All right, yeah, that looks all right. Might be a little bit hard to see. Might just maximize it a bit. Let me get. Maybe I'll get these pictures up. This is pretty old. 70, well, okay, so this is a, a picture from 1776. Looks like Sumio or something like that. Um, from like kind of like a, a, an encyclopedia of, of yokai, all these kind of, you know, mystical spirits. Komaitachi is, um, I hope I'm going to get this right. Um, it's sort of like a fox-like uh, spirit, I think. And the the kind of, what it is, is like, based on a natural phenomenon where like there's sort of a, a whirlwind some kind of like sort of fast wind um that like kind of injures you like sort of it's kind of like a good example of, of understanding what it is is like when when you get kind of a, a little cut like kind of a little sort of slice in your finger or on your body or something um but you don't know what it's, what it's from um and uh you know sometimes people might say like oh you got you got slashed by a kamaitachi um, which is sort of this kind of you know um, uh, spirit that that is the is in the wind that kind of cuts you as it kind of sweeps by sort of thing. Pretty sure that that's what it is. 
Um, correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> anybody that knows more about this than I do, but that's uh, that's what I believe it is. So, um, yeah. Um, so, Night of the these things. Um, and I, I think, uh, I don't want to give away anything about the story, but um, we'll probably see how these guys figure into the story. Um, yeah. So, that's Komai Tachi. Um, so the thing about, um, yeah, the thing about this game, and I think uh, a lot of other sound novels of, of its ilk is that, uh, depending on the choices you make. So, so every once in a while during, you know, as we read through the story, um, we'll be faced with, uh, a choice. Kind of ranges from like two, two to three, maybe sometimes four, different options, um, and it's basically like what what you choose for the protagonist to say, and, and and they all kind of have different tones and that kind of thing. So based on the the choices that you make at those points, uh, the story kind of like branches out into quite a few different uh, tones, I guess you call it. Like, um, for example, like, you know, if you kind of answer consistently in a certain way. Uh, you might kind of end it, the story might kind of turn into more of a sort of romance love story kind of thing with your main love interest or like you know it might kind of steer towards the direction of being like a really supernatural like um, there, there might be a lot of kind of you know ghostly happenings that kind of thing or it might just be a straight ahead you know murder mystery uh, or it might be really silly and comedic the, the tone there's a lot of tones apparently like and because and, there's a lot of endings uh, I, do, I can't remember exactly how many there are in this game but there's a lot of endings, uh, sort of, you know, like false endings. I don't, I think it's like a true ending. It's a lot, it happens a lot in these games where like you, yeah, the, you get an ending and then you're sort of meant to go back and, you know, um, choose something different and then see how the story branches out from there. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see what kind of uh, story it'll, it'll end up in. For, for this stream, like I, I probably won't do all, all the endings that probably take too long but um yeah i might kind of I'll, I'll look into what what the best ones to get are and then we'll kind of do that maybe one or two probably then we'll move on to something else um great so without further ado i hope you're all comfortable everybody that's tuning in um sit back relax uh, i have my glass of whiskey with me um, th these these sound novels can get a little bit spooky sometimes, so it's it's sort of it has been difficult for me in the past to pl to play them by myself. So I'm I'm glad I'm sort of doing this where it feels like I'm I'm not alone. <laughs> but a little bit of whiskey uh, never goes astray at the same time to to steal my nerves. Um, yeah, I got my dictionary out. The incense is lit. Um, it's uh, a hot uh, summer weather in Tokyo at the moment. Uh, I don't know where everybody's tuning in from, but it's uh, it's midsummer in Tokyo. Today was it was a little bit cooler than usual, but we've been having mid 30 degree weather, Celsius that is, um, for a couple of weeks now. And they say, uh, in Japan at least, that ghost stories are the best way, well, one of the best ways to cool down in the summer, the more you know. There, I I would often kind of see that, that sort of, you know, that kind of, uh, you know, that sentiment uh, in a lot of places in Japan, like on you know, um, film advertisements and and like you know, uh, th things like advertising spooky stuff. And I was like, why? I don't get it. Like, why would you? What's the deal with with spooky so, spooky stories in summer? I don't I don't know. I never kind of got the connection. It's like I, so I think it's like a cultural thing. And I so I I told that to a Japanese friend of mine once. And uh, he said, well, the idea is like when, when you kind of, you know, read a spooky story or you watch a scary movie, you get a bit of a shiver down your spine and, it, and your body feels like it's cold. So that's why, that's apparently why you got to do scary stuff in, in summer because it cools you down. So there you go. So I hope uh, we can all cool, have a nice cool down. Personally, like I, I associate scary stuff, like scary movies and that kind of thing. I associate that with more the winter and that kind of thing. You know, it's it's sort of about, you know, getting under a blanket, and, you know, 
shielding yourself from the horrors in a nice warm, warm space because, uh, you know, the cold, cold, coldness is scary. Particularly, I find, I think you'll find in this story, it's, this story is in a cold location. Um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, let's get started. So, uh, th- because this is the, f- the first episode of this this show, sounds like Kite on Time, um, we're just kind of going to see how it, how it happens. Um, I, uh, yeah, I've, I've sort of been uh, thinking about how I'm going to go about it and, um, yeah, I'll try to sort of make it as listenable as possible and, and as enjoyable as possible. Basically, I'm going to be translating on the fly. Um, so, yeah, I have my dictionary up and ready. Um, I think, you know, in, in this one, there's probably nothing too difficult, but I might have to, you know, certain words or something now and again, but I, I, hopefully I'll, that won't kind of... Uh, hinder um, the atmosphere. I think it'll be fine. Um, and so if there's anyone tuning in that, that does understand Japanese, um, might, they might uh, realize that uh, I'm, I'm not kind of translating it word by word. Like I, I think I'll probably take a, a few liberties um, just because like, um, uh, yeah, as you're probably already aware, like kind of translating from one language into the other, especially Japanese into English, there's a lot of uh, nuance and um, kind of Japan-centric phrasings that just kind of don't really carry over. And uh, so I'll be kind of approaching it from, you know, the, the voice will be of of kind of um, like an English novel as much as possible, like a kind of, you know, natural English uh, spoken word kind of thing. So, you know, um, also, I'm not that good at acting, so you know, like we'll just kind of see how we go with all the dialogue and that kind of thing. But um, so, the, yeah, I might kind of not translate everything word by word. I'll just kind of you know um, do it as 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 easily as I can. Um, I'm just checking something. All right, great. So let's get stuck in, shall we? Um, chat is open, I think, um, and I'm pretty sure I'm looking at the right place, so if, uh, please, um, if you're watching, join in, um, post anything you like, within reason, um, I do kind of have it on, uh, normal latency, I think, so there might be a bit of a delay, if you do post something, it might be, might take me a while to, um, read it, but, uh, yeah, please, uh, participate in any way you see fit. So, um, let's have a look. This is looking good. I'm just on the, this is the explanation menu. Um, so here, there's kind of a few options, that kind of thing. And uh, so we have the option of, so it, there's, a, there's a page that kind of gives us the introduction. The one that's highlighted says like, this introduction to all the characters that are in the story. Then there's like an explanation of the game itself. And so I might just kind of go through those two first off, just to kind of get us started get the necessary background information that we have um all right let me just set this up all right so first of all this is toru toru t t o o r u i think it's probably the space spell so this is us uh, this is the um, the protagonist, and uh, we'll, yeah, we'll be kind of experiencing the story from his point of view. So yeah, um, I'll be using like first person uh, way of speaking, and it'll be it'll be this guy. So a little bit about him: he's uh, he lives in Greater Tokyo. Uh, he's a university student. He's 172 centimeters tall, weighs 60 kilograms, and he's kind of a, a, a midweight, uh, kind of medium height. I don't know, just overall uh, neutral guy. <laughs> Easy to kind of insert yourself uh, into this man uh, in terms of personality and looks very kind of just a general Japanese male. Um, he met Mari. Mari is is the other kind of main character. This person's female 
acquaintance. Well, we shouldn't say acquaintance. It says met Marty at university, um, but they've yet to officially start dating. So they're kind of, they're in sort of a thing, but uh, nothing's happened as of yet. Now, another thing you might realize is the character is, is kind of shaded blue. His whole body's blue. So this is another kind of characteristic of um, uh, sound novels is that th there's kind of no... They don't paint the characters like with detail and that kind of thing. They're just outlines, or silhouettes. And the idea behind that is is so that you can literally sort of insert yourself into the stories. Or you can kind of picture other people as the other characters, that kind of thing. Which is, I guess, you know, in, in theory it sounds like a cool idea, but but it can be, I don't know, it's a little bit creepy to me. But um so in the actual sort of main screens as we go through the story, you'll see like there's the backgrounds and you can see what position the characters are in and, and their kind of gestures and that kind of thing. They don't move, but um yeah, you can see kind of get an idea of what sort of physical state they're in, but it'll just be a silhouette. So there you go. And of course the men are blue. And the uh, women are, oh, this, she's she's blue. I think the other women might be pink. They only use two colors, blue and pink. And that's how they, they distinguish between male and female, I think. Thank goodness for that. Um, because, yeah. Um, so this is Mari. Um, she goes to the same university as Toru. And they're the same age. She's 165 centimeters tall. She has incredible fashion style. Uh, and uh, she's a beautiful woman with long hair, straight long hair. So another kind of, yeah, very neutral woman. Um, yeah, default, I think. Um, she's uh, an accomplished sportsman, sports person, I should say. Um, and uh, she's smart. Um, great. So, so she's the ideal woman. Everything's perfect. Uh, Kobayashi is her uncle, and uh, that's how she came to stay at the pension. So Kobayashi is another character. We'll get to him in a minute. Um, the pension. There's this word pension, um, which is kind of interesting. I don't know if this translates to English properly or not. Pension is like, it's not it's not money for old people. That's not what I'm talking about. It's, um, I think this, this comes from English. Pension is kind of like a, it, it's it's it, the word comes from an old kind of um, boarding house, like kind of a school boarding house. Uh, I don't know where it comes from, um, but it, it, these days it's kind of it, th this word in Japanese is used to refer to <clears throat> kind of like usually like a, a log house or kind of like a, a nice old cottage or whatever, like out in the country and that kind of thing. Um, so, for example, like this this story is set. Uh, on or near a ski slope up in the mountains um, so there's a lot of around those kind of you know ski slope areas a lot of log houses and, and what they call pensions so what should I do so obviously this this word will crop up a lot in the story are we okay with using the word pension I don't know I feel a bit weird about it it's I just think about the the funding thing um, maybe I'll just say guest house I want to say in, in, but in, in can kind of be hard to use because it sounds like that other word, in. What will I do? Um, maybe guest house is fine, I think. Let's just go with that. Why not? If anyone's got a better idea, uh, I'd love to hear it. Um, Kobayashi is Marty's uncle and he owns a guest house. So let's have a look at this guest house. The guest house is called Spur. Spool. Spur. I guess that's what it is. Spool. Spool. The name of the guest house is Spool. All right, let's just go with it. So this is a list of all the employees at Spool, the guest house. Uh, first off is Kobayashi Jiro. So in, in Japanese, um, as some of you might know, that the names like... Last name comes first, first name comes last. So I'll just kind of read it as it's written, last name, then first name, because that's, you know, easier. But, uh, yeah, if, if I'm kind of just chatting about the characters or whatever, I don't know, I'll use whatever they use in the story, I guess. 
Um, sometimes that you know people refer to each other as the second name or the first name. It can get a bit confusing, but uh, that's all right. We'll we'll just go with it. Um, so this is yeah Kobayashi Jido. So this is Marty's uncle, and he's the owner of of the guest house Spool. <laughs> that's a great name. Uh, a few years ago, he uh, he escaped from the salaryman life. So salaryman, of course, is a kind of typical Japanese business person. Um, and uh, started uh, managing uh, this guest house. Um, he's around 45 years old and he's slightly thinning. He's good at cooking and uh, the, the, the meals that are cooked at the guest house are usually always uh, his meals. So there you go. Seems like a nice guy. Uh, his wife is Kobayashi Kyoko. So Kyoko, I think so. He'll probably refer to her as Kyoko quite, quite a lot. So maybe, yeah, keep Kyo- Kyoko in mind. Um, it's the wife of uh, Kobayashi-san, and uh, she's friendly. Um, she's very caring about people, and she's you know they call her Obasan, which is sort of like um, you can use it as the word for auntie, kind of like an auntie sort of figure, I guess. Um, slightly sh- uh, shortly statured, and uh, she's a strong-willed person that supports her husband. Hmm. Uh, she's not good at cooking. Apparently. <laughs> so the man's the cook of the house, I think. Uh, and then there's uh, Kubota Toshio. Kubota Toshio. Uh, he works at the guest house uh, part-time. And he refers to himself as a sixth-year university student. So I guess that means that he's he's deferred for like two years, probably. Because standard uh, undergrad degrees in, in Japan are four years, I think, generally. Is that right? Or is it three years? Six does seem a bit long. I think the joke there is that, yeah, it's it's too long. He's, he's been at, at university for too long. He just probably keeps deferring and, and you know, shirking his duties as a university should. Um, he's 184 centimeters tall. Uh, and he has, a, he has a body like a sportsman. He likes skiing. Um, and his clothes are also like a sportsman. So, okay. So, very kind of sporty sort of dude. There you go. So, th- oh, and there's also, right, Shinozaki Midori. Uh, Midori, yeah. She also works at the guest house. She works and lives at the guest house um, part-time. I guess living there, living there wouldn't be part-time. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Maybe just living there for, for the, the on season or something. Um, we'll, f- we'll find out. Yeah, she's uh, in her 20s. She's kind of medium built, medium height. Same as Toru, our, our protagonist whatever that means. She has a round face uh, and she wears her hair in a ponytail. That's her. Shinozaki Midori. So then we've got some other characters that are are at the guest house and other people that are staying together with us. So we've got Kitano Kitano Keiko. Kitano Keiko. Keiko, yeah. Um, Out of a group of three office ladies she's she's one of a group of three so this this it says ol here i'm sure you can see this this is kind of another sort of weird japanese english term um that literally means office lady a kind of a yeah not not at such a great term i think they, they still use it these days but um yeah that's what it means what can you do so you know hear the you hear the term ol you think you know someone the kind of woman that works in an office probably doing like menial duties most of the time I think like it's not a very kind of glamorous position um, you know uh, doing administrative stuff um, serving th- these these kind of types of employees like always serve tea to get to you know um, like clients that come to the office and that kind of thing um, sorry my chair's a bit squeaky um, so there's a group of three office ladies that have come to the, the guest house this is one of them Keiko is one of them um, she's slightly, uh, I don't want to say fat. What can I say? That's a nice word. She's kind of uh, a little bit chubby. Um, but it, it kind of has a sort of nice, uh, kind of cute look to it. That's what it says. <laughs> um, she enjoys eating more than she enjoys skiing. Yeah, that's the kind of woman she is. That's what it says. So there you go. Um, bit of a stereotype, but what are you going to do? 
Um, then we have Watase Kanako. Watase Kanako. Watase is kind of an interesting second name. We don't hear that too, too often. Um, she's a thin woman with long hair. Um, she has a f her face is what you would call beautiful, but uh, she has kind of a bit of a thin impression. Thin impression is kind of an interesting way of putting it. Maybe not so much kind of an impressionable person, this person, I guess. That's a little bit mean, but, you know, what are you going to do? Um, and she wears pretty flashy clothing as well. Not that we'd be able to tell with a silhouette, but we just have to imagine that, I guess. And then we have Kawamura Aki. Kawamura Aki. So Aki-san, yeah? Um, so the, the um, Kawamura Aki and, and the previous two people, they, they form the, the group of the three office ladies. I think that maybe we'll probably find out if they work at the same office. I think they probably do. Um, so Kawamura Aki is, has a, a boyish image. So kind of a bit of a tomboy, I think. Um, she's the same age as the others. 18. Wow. So these people are really young. 18 years old. They work in an office. Great. Um, but she looks younger than she is. Jeez. Uh, because of her clothing, apparently. So she's kind of a young-looking, tomboy, 18-year-old office lady. Wow. This is, this is going to be interesting how, how uh, the fates of these characters all intertwine. <laughs> okay. Next up, we have Kayama Seichiro. He's from Osaka. He's a um, business person. He's from a, from a oh, he's the head of a company. Sorry. Um, so he knows Kobayashi, the owner of the guest house, um, through business relations. There you go. Um, his hair is thinning. He's um, oh, he's fat. <laughs> I don't want to find a better word than that. Uh, and his, his stomach hangs out. He's got a kind of overhanging stomach. So we can kind of imagine that, I guess. No worries. Um, next up, we have Kayama Haruko. Kayama Haruko is uh, Kayama Seichi's wife. So they come together. Um, Urizane ga? What does that mean? She's an attractive Japanese woman. With an oval face, Urizane, that's the first time I've, I've heard that before, Urizane, Urizane Gao. Uh, she's tall, and uh, in contrast to her husband, she's quite a fancy person. There you go. Um, she doesn't speak a whole lot, and she's very inconspicuous. Right? So not much of a personality, I guess, but fancy at the same time. Uh, next up is Tanaka Ichiro. Hmm. His age and his uh, work status is, are both uh, unclear. We don't know how old this guy is or what he does. Mm. He wears a blackish suit uh, with an overcoat. And he wears sunglasses. I mean, I don't, this guy is very mysterious. I don't like this guy. Um, a very... Uh, Inappropriate outfit for a ski uh, a, a ski resort. I can say that again. So that's so yeah, not much of a description for this guy, but um, there you go. That's probably the idea. All right, and then we have Mi Mikimoto Yosuke. Quite a few characters in this story. Hope, hopefully, we can all keep track. I'm sure it'll be fine. But um, Mikimoto Yosuke is a freelance cameraman. And he specializes in taking landscape photos. Hmm. That would explain why he's come to this guest house near a ski slope. He's at 185 centimeters tall, exactly the same as uh, Kubota. <laughs> and uh, he has a solidly built frame. Uh, he's got a bit of a beard, a bit of a five o'clock shadow. Uh, and he looks like a mountain man. Yeah, so mountain man, they, they use this term a lot in Japanese, mountain man, man of the mountains. I guess it's sort of someone who's a bit rough around the edges, looks like they kind of spend a lot of time out in, in the wild, 
a little bit kind of uh, unkempt, maybe. There you go. So that's it. There, there are our characters. I believe that's all we have to worry about. So um, let's kind of get get started. Let's just have a look at the game explanation. So, all right. So this is Komaitachi no Yori, Komaitachi no Yoru. The setting of Komaitachi no Yoru is uh, a guest house um, situated far off into the mountains. Um, you, the protagonist, have come to the guest house with your lover. Obviously, the, the, the protagonist is male, so with your girlfriend. Um, the two of you have come to the this, this ski slope uh, to, to enjoy skiing. Um, however, there's a terrible murder case that happens at the guest house. Um, will you be able to solve the case and escape the guest house unharmed? Mm, will we? As the story progresses, um, there are selections that will become available. When you select something, um, the story will change to based on your selection. Um, when you proceed through the selections, uh, there will be a screen where you have to enter the name of the culprit. So here's where you, there's where you enter the name of the culprit. So you have to guess who the, who the killer is. Jeez. Okay. Um, what happens after then, uh, uh, whether it becomes a tragedy or a happy end, is all dependent on your skills of deduction. So, um, if you end up with a, a tragic ending, uh, go back to where you had the selection and uh, try it again. Mm. And resume the story. And, uh, yeah, to move around in the map, and press the triangle button. Yeah, so we can take a look at the story map whenever we like. That, that, that helps. Um, in Komaitachi no Yori, which uses a multi-scenario system, uh, several stories or endings uh, have been prepared. Um, no, it just says the same thing as the previous screen. Okay. Please enjoy Komaitachi no Yori. Great. All right. Well, let's get started, shall we? Oh, okay. So the, the kind of introduction took a bit of time, but um, that's all right. We're all friends. All right. How do you mean? Let's start. I'm going to use memory card one. Let's start a new new file, I suppose. There we go. Unused. Whiskey really warms you up. <clears throat> Welcome to Guesthouse Spool. Your name is Toru, and your partner is Mari. Is that correct? So here we can change the names of, of the, the two protagonists. Um, I think we're going to keep it as, as it is. What do you reckon? These are the, um, the heroes of our story, so might as well... Uh, their names grew down in history. All right, so let's start as it is. All right, please sit back and enjoy the world of Kamai Tachi no Yori. Hope this sounds all right. I might kind of just turn it down a little bit. Okay. Should be okay. Breathes a sigh of relief, reaching the rest house uh, on the on my skis, which I only just remembered how to use. Murray appeared in front of me and sprayed snow right in front of me. My goggles were covered in fine snow. I couldn't see anything. Oh, Toru, you're just like a snowman. 
Murray laughed. Taking my goggles off, I started to brush off the snow that had covered my clothes. In any case, I think falling over is uh, much suits me much better than skiing. That's not what I mean. Toru, I reckon you're getting really good, really fast. Mari took her goggles off as well and showed a smiling face. It was the first time I'd seen her smiling face in over a few hours. It was like seeing sunlight pouring through the clouds. I took one more closer look at Mari. Her white ski wear matched perfectly with her black hair. No matter how difficult the spot on the ski slope was, she managed to ski with a plum and was the focus of the whole ski slope. I'm sure a lot of people expected to see a beautiful face beneath those goggles. That's just the kind of place a ski slope is. Seeing as it's Marty after all, I'm sure nobody's expectations. She would be able to live up to everybody's expectations of the beautiful face, of course. So I'd been annoyed at uh, seeing her skills on the slope, seeing as she'd grown up in a snow country, probably somewhere like Hokkaido or somewhere where snow falls quite a lot. But now all I could feel was pride. I also know that it's not just her beautiful face, but also the ski wear. The style of the the fashionable style of the ski ski wear that she wore. It's the other way around. Her style of clothing that she wore beneath her heavy ski wear was also uh, quite appealing. Do you want to take another go on the slopes? Are you still going to be skiing? I asked her. We'd been training intense, intensely since the morning, and I could barely even stand. Why, what's wrong? Come on, just one more time, she says. She puts her hands together as if she's praying. Come on, let's go home. Look, there's clouds coming over. I don't like the look of them. I pointed towards the sky. I wasn't kidding. Just before, the sun that had been poking its head in and out of the clouds had completely disappeared. The entire sky was black and heavy. Yeah, you're right. I guess there might be a snowstorm tonight. Mightn't there? Money furrowed her brows. All right, well, let's go back for today. So we climbed in Murray's uncle's four-wheel drive and sped off. I met Murray in April this year at university. (laughs) With a kind of persistent and nagging style of attack uh, through asking her out for dates uh, several times I just managed to get to the point where we're together this autumn so it's autumn now I think in the story actually no maybe it's a little bit later but they just managed to get to that point where (laughs) something's happening between the two two of them after he kind of persistently pursued her. I think that's what it's getting. No matter how much I pushed, it seemed like it was just I was fighting the battle all by myself. So he's pretty desperate. And then suddenly, she invited me to go skiing with her 
which honestly took me by surprise. Her uncle, Kobayashi Jiro, owned a guest house in Shinshu. Shinshu is like a, kind of an area to the like, west of Tokyo, a little bit to the north. It's where places like Nagano, uh, Matsumoto, places like that are. L- lots of snow, lots of mountains. Quite, I think the sea level, level is quite high, I think. However, the guest house was a little bit removed from the ski slope. And uh, seeing as it was, no, despite the fact that it was during the peak season, uh, there wasn't that many people staying there. So uh, they offered for us to stay there at a cheaper price. And that's why money invited me. Of course, I, I said yes. And yesterday, in other words, the 21st of December, Uh, We arrived in Shinshu. That's a nice effect. Around the time we arrived at the guest house, it had already grown dark and snow had begun to fall. Spool, which was owned by the Kobayashis, so Mr. and Mrs. Kobayashi, the outside of it looked like a log cabin, and the inside was uh, a fashionable white, a stylish, fashionable guest house. In terms of the food, the menu had a lot of different countries, or perhaps maybe it didn't have any country at all. All in all, it was just a a varied menu. And above that, the flavor was next to none. What does that mean? Sanko? Sashi? I'm just looking at this word. Ah. Hmm. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. An expression. Kan- kankodori ga naku. Which means to the, um, there's not much business, not much activity happening. That's an interesting phrase. I, I don't think I've ever heard that. Oops. Um, Literally translated, this phrase means uh, the cuckoo clucks or the cuckoo cries. Hmm, I wonder where that comes from. Literally saying this place, the cuckoo cries this place. <laughs> I guess that means uh, there's not much, um, they don't get much business. <clears throat> so, um, not only is, does the place not see much business, but apparently it's not even published in any travel magazines so they're not advertising very much which is interesting and so they have a lot of time free so that's why they're offering it for a cheap price this is something that I realized after arriving yesterday I thought Kobayashi had just been looking out for us. My room and Mari's room were unfortunately separated. Well, as I should say, of course they're separated. For me, here's our first suggestion. Okay, so for me, ah, so this is what we choose to do now can go back to the room for a bit, change, and then head to the lounge, the conversation lounge um, near, near the entrance. Or go to the room to change and head to one of the rooms to talk with Marty. What should we do? 
healthy. I'm just going to keep it neutral. I don't want to kind of be too perverted. I think you can kind of make some pretty perverted decisions here. <laughs> Look, let's just keep as neutral as possible. Let's go back to the room, change, and uh, head to the lounge. Let's do that. Hope she doesn't end up hating me. So we headed back to our rooms, got changed, and went to the lounge to relax for a bit. There was a large brown table and a few sofas. We decided to wait there until dinner began. Just when we'd sat down, we heard women's voices coming from the second floor. It seemed like they were office ladies. Uh, but they could have been around the same age as us or maybe a little bit younger. They descended the stairs, talking animatedly. I didn't think the guest house would be this far. The one that said that was the one that was thin, with long hair. She kind of had a bit of a fierce look in her eyes, but she was pretty much beautiful, I'd say. <laughs> a little bit of a thin impression. It said that the cooking was good at this guest house, though, right? The one that had a magazine rolled up in one hand, in her right hand was someone that looks like they'd much prefer to eat rather than ski. <laughs> Even now, she held a snack in her hand and was eating all by herself. It seemed like maybe she was a little bit overweight, but uh, she had kind of a charming nature, like a panda. <laughs> That's why I said it. I didn't want to leave it to Keiko. If we wanted to eat something delicious, wouldn't we just go somewhere in Tokyo? Jeez. The long-haired woman said angrily. No, that's fine. I think the atmosphere is quite nice. And I reckon the service here is much better. The woman with glasses seemed to kind of calm down the other woman by saying so. She had a short haircut. It was a bit like a, 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 a boy, but her glasses really suited her. She looked like she was really good at her job. <laughs> Which one of the girls do you like? Marty asked me in a whispering voice. I've got another choice here. <laughs> Three choices. Which one do we like? So our choices are, I, our choice A is like, what? What are you talking about? That's not what I... So kind of a bit of a, you know, just... Uh... <laughs> choice number B is like, well, that's a silly question, honey. The one that I like is you. <laughs> That's the second, the second option. It's a bit of a kind of playboy sort of option. Though. This option C is. <laughs> Wait a second. Let me take a closer look at them. <laughs> They're all pretty. The A is the only natural choice, really, unless I want to be kind of a bit of an asshole or a different kind of asshole. I'm just going to go with A. What, what are you talking about? That's not what I'm... I was flustered. Marty was right next to me. And it's not like I'd be watching other girls while she's right there. But I couldn't think of any excuse to say right then and there. So 
Excuse me, can you just shut the... Sh ah, can you take a picture for us? One of the women approached me with a camera and asked me. I think she probably asked me because I'm a man. Uh, sure, okay. The camera was an auto-focus camera. And the flash was the one that decided whether it needed to flash or not. So, I took it in my hands, but... I wasn't really good at saying cheese. <laughs> I just think it's such a stupid thing to say. And uh, I can't understand why anyone would say it. But I guess it makes people smile. Who knows? But the word cheese, the end of it, the z, z cheese makes everyone kind of do a bit of a weird face. So, wouldn't it be better to say something like peach? Or kiwi? That's what I found myself thinking, but... Uh, I was embarrassed, so... I didn't tell anyone. I just peered through the viewfinder. The three women huddled close together. Everything alright? I said, and pressed the shutter. Thank you! Taking the camera back, the women bowed their heads. I thought staying silent in that moment was a little bit of a weird thing to do, so I decided to introduce myself. The woman with the long hair that complained about the guest house being far away from the ski slope was Watase Kanako. Watase Kanako. Okay. So Kanako, Kanako has long hair. I just remember that. The girl that was eating snack, with a slightly kind of chubby frame was Kita no Keiko. Keiko. Kita no Keiko. Keiko is the chubby one. Okay. And the one that was holding the camera, the one with the glasses, was Kawamura Aki. Kawamura Aki. Kawamura Aki with glasses. The tomboy, right? All of them were uh, office ladies of 18 years of age. I guess this is normal. <laughs> Uh, we just arrived before. Would you happen to know where the ski slope is? Kanoko asked me. But, uh, today was their first day, so... Huh? I didn't know whether she was being nice or... Not nice. I mean, I think, I think it means that he's meeting for the first time today. So Mari stepped in and answered for me. Ah, I know what it was. They were asking whether the ski slope was good or not. My mistake, I <laughs> misread. So Tori didn't know whether the ski slope was good or not. So Mari comes in and says, it's pretty good. The lifts aren't that crowded either. So, it seemed as if both Kanako and, and Mari seemed to be competitively, competitively into skiing. And they started talking about how good quality the snow was, where it was good and that kind of thing. The other two just uh, stood by and listened to that, them talking. It seemed like maybe Kanako brought the two of them along against their will. Definitely seen the way. Oh my god, that's a terrifying image. 
Ooh, I like that. Just then, the sound of an engine drew closer and stopped at the front of the guest house. It's an ambulance. <laughs> it seemed like a new guest had just arrived. After a while, the entrance door, uh, the bell at the entrance door sounded and an incredibly loud Osaka accent filled the room. So this is something that would be difficult to translate. That I don't think I'll bother with it. Osaka, Osaka accent is, is sort of pretty... It's a pretty thick accent from from Osaka, and it, and it it has it's a very kind of has a very strong characteristic. It's generally kind of associated with with people that have a really boisterous sense of humor. A lot of kind of Japanese comedians are from. Uh, oh, I just pause it. Ah, so we can go back and take a look at the log. That's good. Um, so if someone speaks in an Osaka accent, they're kind of pre- they they're pretty friendly and kind of you know lovable and a little bit kind of you know um, of the of the countryside, let's say <laughs> maybe not that's that's probably the thing, but yeah, kind of quite a different uh, sort of warm accent to Tokyo, which is a lot more flatter and, and a bit colder. So we get the idea already that, that this person with an Osaka accent, Kayama. Kayama Sadechi. I think he's probably a pretty lovable kind of guy. Ah, oh, thank God. I thought I was going to... I thought I was going to die. White snow covering the shoulders of his coat. The shoulders of their coat, rather. A man and a woman enter the guest house. Around 50 years old around there, slightly overweight, uh, slightly chubby faced man, and a tall, thin woman in her late thirties. Ah, Kayama-san, welcome. You're a little bit late, I was worried. Kobayashi came out from the back of the guest house and welcomed the two, two people. Fierce snowstorm just happened, and we got lost. Looking out the window, snow that had only been falling a little bit outside was starting to gain force. The cuckoo clock, there's the cuckoo. <laughs> cuckoo clock on the wall announced seven o'clock. As if totally, totally reflexively, we looked at our watches. But it was only 6.55. Hmm. I guess it's late. The cuckoo clock is five minutes, five minutes late. The food's ready, so if everyone would like to congregate in the cafeteria, please do so. Shinozaki Midori, a part-time worker, came out from the cafeteria and announced. All right, uh, let me take your bags upstairs and your coat. And uh, if you'd like to come into the cafeteria, Kobayashi said. For some reason, probably because I was looking at her, I locked eyes with Kayama-san's wife. She kind of had a bit of a sad look to her. It was just for a moment, though. After that, she smiled weakly and slightly bowed her head. I did the same, panicking a little bit. I realized that Marty was also looking at her. It seemed like they were going to get involved somehow, but... Mm. Instead, she just whispered to me. She's quite a beautiful person. So now we have to respond to this. We can respond... Yeah. 
<laughs> honestly, I guess. Or B, we can say, actually, I think you're beautiful. <laughs> I think you're much more beautiful. Mm, yeah, let's keep it natural. Let's just say, yep. Yep, I said honestly. She looked at me seriously and asked. Mm. So, I guess you think that kind of woman... That, that's more ladylike. The kind of person that seems like they'd fly away if you blew on them. <laughs> you think that's probably more ladylike, right? Mm, I guess so. But I think you have ladylike qualities as well. Me too? What do you mean by me too? That's a bit rude, don't you think? Mm, looks like I messed up my words. She looked a little nonplussed, stood up and went towards the cafeteria. Flustered, I followed her. The tables in the cafeteria already had knives and forks set up. The group of three women, or girls I should say, and the couple that arrived just before had already been had already sat down in, in the chairs. The table that Marty had sat down in. I joined Marty at the table she had sat down. She had sat down in. Oh, that's difficult. Should be simple grammar. In the middle of the table, there was a candle that was in the shape of a Christmas tree. It illuminated Marty's profile, the side of her face, as she stared out the window. Choices here. Choice number A is beautiful. So I guess she he's complimenting her on, on her beauty. <laughs> or we could say, let's drink a toast to your eyes. <laughs> or we could say, you're very sexy. Like 007, it says. Ooh, wow, that's a bit dangerous. Gachon is the, the other option. Oh, that's a bit of an in-joke. Uh, yeah. So, we could be... Try to be sincere. It says, like... Let me say, beautiful. Like an actress from a foreign movie. <laughs> Sorry, not an actress. So, the protagonist is thinking of himself as, like, a, an, an actor from a foreign movie. Drink a toast to your eyes. We can be romantic. We can be um, a little bit vulgar, I guess. <laughs> Charmingly vulgar. Or just make a straight up joke. Yeah, not a, not a lot of great choices. I'm just go, gonna go with A again, I think. Just neutral. Complimenting her on her looks. Why not? Let's go with this one. You're beautiful. Just like an actor in a foreign movie, I decided to be smart. But somehow I just couldn't bring myself to say it. Instead, I just looked at her. What are you looking at? She said. Are you that hungry? Jeez. Kobayashi's wife, Kyoko, and... Midori brought, started bringing the food out from the kitchen. Those who were staying over were myself, Mari, the three girls, 
and the couple that had come late. I thought it was just those people, but there was one more. Over in the corner of the cafeteria, sitting as if melting into the, co- into the wall, was a man in a coat. Even though he was in the middle of his meal, he kept his overcoat and his hat on, and he wore mysterious black sunglasses. He didn't look like someone that had come to ski, but he didn't look like someone who had come on business either. Yakuza? That was my first impression. Alright, what, what do we do in this situation? First option is, but why would Yakuza be in a place like this? The second option is, telling Marty that I thought he was a Yakuza. Mm. <laughs> mm. I, 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 this is what I, I, choice A, wondering why Yakuza would come to a place like this. That's probably what I would think. That's probably what I would say in that situation. So I'm just going to go with that. It's my instinct. <clears throat> but why would a Yakuza come to a place like this? Without thinking, I felt I, the words, those words came out of my mouth. But thinking about it, I don't think a Yakuza would come to a guest house. He was politely sipping his soup, and watching him do that, perhaps he was just a nice guy, and didn't look like it. (laughs) Maybe he was just too embarrassed to take his sunglasses off, and he's probably just going to go looking like that to the ski slopes. In any case, seeing the food come out from the kitchen, I was totally impartial to his existence. Wow, this looks delicious, Marty said as she sipped a soup of the a spoonful of the soup. Thinly cut vegetables. Mm. Okay. Minestrone filled with thinly cut vegetables. The hot soup warmed our bodies right to the core. The food that came out after that, all of it was incredibly satisfying. And from around the room, we heard sighs of satisfaction. I found myself thinking that this place should open as a restaurant rather than a guest house. In any case, perhaps that middle-aged couple and the man in the coat that seemed like a Yakuza could have come here just to enjoy the food. Is this something that you made, Kyoko? Mari asked as she was sipping her coffee after the meal. I think Kyoko is just helping. The person that likes cooking is the husband. Apparently he wanted to be a chef ever since he was young. Hmm. Well, I think maybe I switched up the, the voices. I think Toru Tor- is asking Mari about Kobayashi-san. 
He was once a businessman, but uh, he quit, and now he's chasing his dreams. The reason why he started this guest house is because he couldn't fulfill the dream of his childhood, being a businessman. So he quit that, and now he's here. Yeah, I bet it's tough, though. I see. Yeah, I guess it is. Sometimes, my uncle, in other words, my mother's father, hmm. hang on, wait, what he says, ah, oh, grandfather, so my grandfather, in other words, my mother's father, he owns a few mountains in this area, he owns the land, first of all. And it seemed like he never really had it hard, given that. Hmm, so your family is quite the rich family then, I said. Trying to be as cautious as possible. No, not at all. In any case, the land is... Most of the land went to my uncle. Most of the people in my family are just businessmen. Like normal. My house is small after all. My dreams of... <laughs> ah, I'm glad that... We... <laughs> this is me. So Toru says, like, um, he's glad that they're, they're both of the same social status. So, for example, if she was rich, maybe he'd probably feel a bit embarrassed about being with her because we get the idea that he's probably not rich. So he's breathing a sigh of relief at that fact. <laughs> As everyone finished their meals, they started to leave the cafeteria one by one. Looking at my digital watch, the time said 7.55. Alright, should we go to the NIDA? So NIDA is, I wonder if that's the right word, they use it in Japanese kind of like, Japanese English word for nighttime skiing of after going. Maybe kind of after hours. Some a lot of ski places, you know, keep stay open late till late at night and you can go do a nighter. They say. I couldn't believe Marty had said something like that. <laughs> she stood up, and I said, "What? You're joking, right? In a snowstorm like this? I don't think they'd be doing a nighter." In weather like this, don't you think? Not to mention, my body is wrecked, I said to myself. According to the weather forecast, I don't think anyone's doing nighters. Midori, wearing an apron, leant over and said to us, I think probably staying put here is, is the best, at least for the time being. I wasn't sure how old this part-time worker Midori was. I guess she was probably in her 20s, but she seemed like a high schooler sometimes, but then other times she seemed like an older woman. It seemed like she was almost like a surfer, staying around the ski slopes. She had a face that was completely tanned from the snow. 
Is it that bad? I breathed a sigh of relief, but at the same time, I started to feel a little bit uneasy. According to the weather forecast, it seems like it's going to be really big snow. The scale of which hasn't happened in recent years. Just then, another one of the part-time workers, Kubota Toshio, came from the kitchen. Here he is, Kubota Toshio. Toshio was a 60-year university student. His love of skiing was the most important thing to him. And huh, it seemed like he was shirking his duties in terms of earning class credits so that he could continue working here. He was 180 centimeters, 180 centimeters tall, and he had a sportsman. And his body type was that of a sportsman. Someone who, of course, seemed like they enjoyed skiing. He had around the same level of tan as Midori. I kind of felt a little bit out of place in front of these people. In any case, I was there with my girlfriend, but I looked at Mari to see her reaction. was shining but it didn't seem like she was nervous either so I think he's trying to find out whether she wants to go skiing at this point mm. after the time being I was relieved it's not like we're going to die of hunger here right I asked and Toshio waved his hands and laughed. So kind of this mean that means not like a no gesture. No, it'll be fine. We're pretty far, far removed from the city, so we've got lots of food stock. We've got lots of canned food as well. So all out, I think with this amount of people, we should have enough to eat, fill our stomachs, for about three weeks. Mm. Thinking about staying here in this guest house for three weeks sent shivers down my spine. Although, being together with Marie mm. doesn't sound that bad, really. With that in mind, I took a brief gl glimpse of her. Hmm? What's up? Uh, mm, nothing. Three weeks is a little bit of an exaggeration, Toshio said. But looks like you probably won't be able to ski tomorrow. In any case, school's on holiday at the moment, so I guess it doesn't matter if you stay an extra day or two, right? Yeah, I guess so. I guess it depends on my uncle. You know, things being as of what they are. I guess maybe he'd let us stay for a bit longer. You're fine with that, right, Toru? Fine with this. So we can say, oh yeah, um, I guess that's fine. Or we can say, no way, I got work tomorrow. <laughs> we'll meet tomorrow, maybe it'll be in the future. Or we can say, I 
I guess the accommodation fee would be free, right? So we can be a little bit of a cheapskate. I mean, we have the kind of neutral option. We have the uh, kind of complaining option. Complain about missing work. Or we can just be a bit of a cheapskate. Well, I'm going with go the neutral. I'll just keep this neutral flow happening. Huh? Uh, yeah, that's fine. I said it was well. Actually, I had part-time work to do, but seeing as this was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, I couldn't exactly refuse straight up. In any case, spending a few days here, maybe something nice will happen. Just as I was spinning those thoughts around in my head, there was a noise from the hall. Marion and myself got up from the table and left the cafeteria. Around the front of the guest house, the three women and Kobayashi were talking to each other. Talking, or I guess I should say, they were arguing, maybe. <clears throat> wait, 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 wait a sec. Just calm down and speak slowly. What happened? Well, like I was saying, when I go back to the room, there was this on the floor. Shaking, the three girls handed a shred of paper. Kobayashi. Peering in from the side, it seemed like it was written in a red pen, like a texture pen, and it was scribbled. Tonight, at 12 o'clock, someone will die. Tonight, 12 o'clock, someone will die? I read it aloud and everyone was speechless. After a few seconds, finally, Kobayashi opened his mouth. That's just some trick. Someone's playing a trick. Pretty dumb trick, you ask me, Marty said, furrowing her brows. I guess she's right, it's a pretty dumb trick. Dumb trick, or maybe evil trick. It's probably better. Mean trick. If it is a trick at all. But that means that someone snuck into our rooms and left it there. Oh, it's so gross, I won't be able to sleep. Kind of looked like she'd be, she was about to burst into tears. Well, if it was on the floor, wouldn't they have slid it underneath the crack in the door? You had the door locked, right? As Kobayashi said so. A strange expression came upon the women's faces. Ah, so they didn't have to go inside. Hmm. It seemed like they hadn't realized that. It's still gross, though, said Aki with the glasses. Well, in that case, should I change your rooms for you? Luckily, there's rooms that are open. Are there TVs in those rooms? Keiko said. And Kobayashi looked sorry 
bowed his head, shook his head. Uh, I'm sorry, there's no TVs in any of the rooms. Ah, sorry. Generally, there's no TVs in the rooms. Just two of the rooms have them, but they're the rooms that you're staying in at the moment. What about... Sorry, they're all staying in the same room, so it's in, it's in the room that you're staying in. What about the other room? Uh, unfortunately, it's closed. So if you're wanting to watch the TV, you'll have to stay in the room that you have now and just deal with it. Mm, what should we do? The three women talked amongst themselves. Mm, yeah, I, it's just not going to happen for me. I don't like it. I don't, I don't like how it feels, said Aki. Should we just go without a TV? Said Kanako. Ah, but there's a TV program I want to watch. Said Keiko. Selfishly. Don't worry about the TV. That's not what we came here for. We came here to ski, you know? Said Kanako. Growing angry. I know, but I, I can't not watch it today. Dom Bucket. It's the last episode of Dom Bucket. <laughs> Dom Bucket. What is a Dom Bucket? I wonder if that's an actual show. Uh, I'd never seen it, but I'm pretty sure she was talking about London. What is that? London. London. Mum bucket. <laughs> the name of the show in Japanese is Nondong de Mum bucket. <laughs> About betting on horses in London. That's the direct translation. Who knows? I'm not sure if that's a real show or not. The name of a gambling drama series. I wonder if they actually exist. Probably not. In any case, it was a mean trick. And it seemed like there wasn't any meaning to changing rooms, so the women decided to return to their rooms. But I wonder who could have played a trick like this. It's not like there are any kids that are staying or anything like that. Marty said, facing me. Was it you, Toru? She said. I couldn't believe it. Kobayashi-san Kobayashi was surprised as well, and he looked at me. Oh. <laughs> we can say it was us. Um, so the option, option A is quit messing around. Huh? I never heard of you. Why would I do something like that to women I don't even know? Let's just go with that. That's the most obvious choice. And option number B is, ah, you got me. I'm the one that did it. <laughs> mm. Yeah, let's, let's go with option A. Quit messing around. Why would I do something like that to women that I don't even know? But I guess that's true, Muddy said. That's just not like you, I guess, is it? seemed like she was hmm. the way she said it was a little bit weird for me but no, I let it go just then the phone at the front started ringing yes this is spool we sat down on the sofa in the lounge Half listening to Kobayashi's voice on the phone, and half not listening. His loud voice reached us all the way in the lounge. Ah, it's you, Mikimoto. Well, unfortunately, the 
dinner has already finished, but we have your room prepared for you. Yes, yes. Ah, uh, so you're at the station. Mm, from there, by car, it's probably about 30 or 40 minutes. But mm, there's a pretty bad snowstorm happening right now. Mm, so Mickey Mortal's coming from the station. Well, it seems like there's someone else coming right now. Mm, I guess he's late because of the snowstorm as well, Marty said. I reckon so. Hopefully he doesn't get lost in the storm. Ah, is that so? All right, well, we'll be waiting. Hanging up the phone, Kobayashi went to the second floor, just as the middle-aged couple, the man from the middle-aged couple, came down the stairs. The exposition is a little bit slow to start, but a few little mysterious happenings here and there. A bit of foreshadowing of what might be to come. Do you mind if I turn the TV on? Said the middle-aged man, friendly. Sure, go for it. As I answered, he picked up the remote control on the table and turned the TV on. Seeing some kind of cheesy drama playing on the TV, he started flipping through the channels. Ah, this is no good. None of these channels are doing it. It's not on any of these channels. Mm. I guess I just just have to wait for a bit. He turned the TV off and turned to the two of us. What did you... Did you guys happen to see... At around... I don't know, he's talking about the stock market. I don't know any kind of stock market language. Uh, he's probably talking about. He's probably saying. Do you guys happen to see where the yen ended up today? I see you've been talking about it. The. The yen? Stocks, my boy. I'm talking about the stocks. What kind of country bumpkin are you? Hmm, I should have brought my radio with me. Wow, did I do stocks on the radio? It's amazing. Kayama-san, you promised not to do any rock-related stuff here, didn't you? Said Kobayashi. Ah, Kobayashi. No, it's not like I'm doing any work. I watch it every day. So if I don't watch it, I can't relax. And what about your wife? You're married. So you should treat your work as your work. And you shouldn't combine it with travel.
愛してください。Ever since we got married, huh? What's going on here? Ah,、uh, I see what's going on. So he's courting Kayama.、Uh, right, so this is Kobayashi talking. He says, What about your wife? Ever since I got married, it's just been work, work, work. We haven't traveled even once. Maybe I should just travel by myself. Or maybe we shouldn't travel as a couple. Isn't that what you said, Kayama? Seeing, hearing Kobayashi talk like that to Kayama. <laughs> He noticed that we were watching him. And suddenly stop speaking. Ah,、uh, I guess I should introduce you all. Kayama san? These two kids? No,、oh, this kid is my niece. Her name is Mai. This is who may become my nephew in law. His name's Toru. His nephew in law? That's gross, Uncle. Don't make up these decisions by yourself, Mani said. <laughs> All these decisions are being made. Go ahead, he said. Ah. So. I'm the cool one. Ah, so she's your niece, is she? Hmm, she's quite the looker. I said Kayama. And had a bit of a. Disagreeable look on his face. A bit of a gross look.、Mm. Or maybe, like, maybe it just seems that way. Kayama sounds an old acquaintance of mine from the job I used to work. Way back when. He owns a company in Osaka. Hello? Oh, it's nice to meet you. But, wow, don't you think this is a nice guest house? I know someone else who. Quit their job as a businessman to open a sober shop. But I'd never, this is the first time I've seen anyone do it so properly. Obviously, meaning quitting being a businessman and starting our business. So, are you two students or what? He said, looking over to us.、Uh, yeah. Uncle, you should take a good look at this man. This is what you call a fine man. Ah, I see. So this is Kaima. So I think I obviously I reply. Kaima san said, Kobayashi, you should take a good look at this man. He's a fine man. By the way, are you working? Is your. Employment being decided now? No, not yet. Ah, not yet. Well, I guess it will one of these days. You can work at my company. <laughs> We value hard workers. That's an accent, it's hard to read.
someone who works in the company for two years. What, what are they? I'm not sure. I'm not exactly sure what he's saying, but he's talking about kind of getting a good salary from working for two years. Hmm. But. In some, in other cases, <clears throat> those uh, those without skill, it doesn't matter how much time passes, their salary just doesn't go up. What do you reckon? Do you want to work in my company or not? Mm, I don't know how serious he is. I said. I thought. So now we have another decision. Mm, we can say uh, that's a conversation for the future, kind of thing. Mm. Or we can say yes, please. Let's go with neutral. I think A A is just a neutral vibe, isn't it? Let's just go with that. Mm, I still think that's uh, a conversation for the future. I said, um, taking the safe route. But it seemed like Kaima-san wasn't really listening to what people were saying. Yeah, you know, I mean, the economy is the economy at the moment. It is what it is. Just a sign note, the economy at this point, so, in other words, 1994, I think it was pretty bad. I don't know much about Japanese economic history, but people talk about the, the bubble economy bursting at the end of the 80s. And, uh, oh, whoa. I think it was for the 90s, it was pretty bad. You know? I messed up my screen. So that's probably what he's talking about. But you know, our company, this, that's nothing to do with us. All we have is just hard work. And all we do is hire hard workers. That's what we believe in, hard work. What do you reckon? You come work for us? <laughs> Kobayashi grinned in Mari's direction, staring at her. <laughs> now, options here are A is like, uh, sh yeah, sure, I'll think about it. Or B is, okay, sure. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's go. Um, sure, I'll uh, I'll think about it. I just wanted to get this topic over and done with somehow. You know, in in the first place, our company's strong in economic slumps like this, and you know why. Didn't seem like the conversation was going to end at any time soon. You're causing a fuss. Stop it. A woman's voice echoed quietly. Turning around, we saw Kayama son's wife standing at the foot of the stairs. You're bothering them, she said. Seemed like something was off about her. But seeing her up close seemed like she was younger than I thought she was. She seemed around 35 or 36. Probably about 10 years older than Kayam san himself. Now this is my wife. Haruko. Uh, Haruko, this is uh, Kobayashi's niece and uh, her fiance. This strange fabrication slowly starting to gather speed. <laughs> 
seemed like Monty lost the chance to complain about it as well. Or she felt like not complaining about it. Hello. Good evening. With a slight smile on her face, Haruko sat down next to Kayama-san. So I think the couple couple is Kayama, both are Kayama, but Kayama-san is the man and Haruko is the wife. Let's do that. It was a delicious meal, wasn't it? Oh, there's no need to over-exaggerate. Kobayashi, Kobayashi said, modestly, don't be silly. It was truly wonderful. Hearing you say that, Haruko, gives me confidence. An atmosphere of friendliness started to permeate the room. You know, I'm a little thirsty. Can I get a beer or something? That atmosphere of friendliness was shattered by Kayama-san. Uh, sure. Um, do you guys want something to drink as well? Kobayashi asked as he started to move around the room. Mari and I locked eyes. Uh, okay, well, just a little bit, maybe. She made this gesture with her thumb and her forefinger, just a little bit. As for me, hmm, what should I do? Three choices. First choice is, is I'll just have a little bit as well. It's a neutral choice now. One, one case, Maroni. One case. One case? Case of beer. Surely he's not asking for a case of beer. I think he. Well, maybe he is. So we can choose to say, if you have a case of beer, you'll have enough. <laughs> for me, I guess. <laughs> That's like. I mean, beer is just kind of like the sort of playboy kind of ar asshole route. I think that's what's going on here. And C is the cheapskate op option, saying, like, is it free? So let's go with A, neutral. Uh, I'll have a little bit as well, I said somewhat reservedly. Kobayashi disappeared into the back of the kitchen. Just then, suddenly, outside the window, the sound of a something falling, something heavy falling. Huh? Something just fell. As I moved my body, Marty started laughing. But it's just the snow from the roof. Oh, snow. That's what it was. It seemed like a bit of an anticlimax. I wonder if it really was snow. Looking out into the darkness beyond the window, I realized there were spots of light out in the distance. There were headlights. As the headlights grew closer, the sound of an engine started to be heard as well. There weren't any other houses in this area, so it seemed like it was the guest that was arriving late. As expected, the sound of the engine moved around to behind the guest house and disappeared. Finally, the bell at the entrance sounded and the multi-layered door started to open. Uh, sorry, this is Mikimoto. 
Is there anyone home? A voice sounded all the way up to the lounge. Uh, Mikimoto-san, right? Welcome. I'm glad you could make it. <laughs> Kobayashi ran out from the cafeteria. The large man took his shoes off and stepped up into the foyer. Kobayashi, a little bit flustered, put beers down on the table. And, oops, I missed that last bit. So, put beers down to the table and headed to the front. Dash to the front. Yeah, I thought I was done for out there. The wipers gave up on me. And the car was totally stuck. This Mikimoto fellow started to write in the register at the front, but continued to speak. Somehow his name didn't really match the kind of person that he was. He had a beard and seemed like a total mountain man. The uh, dinner has already finished, but uh, we've got some onigiri if you want to, if you want to eat something. Would you like me to prepare some for you? Kobayashi-san asked. Uh, no, look, I, I had some snacks on the way, so I'm not that hungry. But uh, if you have something warm to drink, I'll have some of that. We've got coffee and we've got black tea. Or we have some soup. Which would you like? All right, I'll have some black tea. All right, I'll take it up to your room. Or, unless you'd like it in the lounge here. Yeah? Uh, okay, I'll have it in the lounge, he said. Looking over to the lounge. Is that so? All right, well, here's your key. Once I put your bags down, uh, once you put your bags down, head down to the lounge. As he handed the key to Mikimoto, he ran upstairs carrying his bags. And the cuckoo clock chimed just once. It was 8.30. Or probably 7.25, right? Because the cuckoo clock's five minutes slow. No, five minutes... Huh? Five minutes ahead. Hmm. Ah, sorry, you, you guys go ahead. Drink without me. Actually, no, that's Kobayashi. Sorry, guys, you can go ahead and start drinking. Kobayashi sunset. Returning from the kitchen. Oh, going back to the kitchen. Okay, well, let's get stuck in, shall we? Say Kayama san. And Mari, myself, and Kayama-san took our glasses and our hands. Cheers! Cheeking our glasses together lightly. We made a toast. In terms of Haruko, Kayama-san's wife, whether she couldn't drink or whether she didn't want to drink, I wasn't sure, but... She didn't reach for a glass. Ah, in this kind of cold weather, drinking a cold beer in the middle of a room like this, this is paradise. Don't you think? Kayama san said, grinning from ear to ear. Another choice here, we could say, yeah. We could say, no. <laughs> Let's say, yeah, sure, yeah, it's paradise. Yeah, I said. Well, I guess he was right. Looking out into the snowstorm, drinking a beer in a room with a heater turned on full blast. It seemed like I was drinking a beer in the middle of summer. Ah, 
Good evening. With loud footsteps. Mikimoto-san, who had just went upstairs, came back down. Ah, so everyone's drinking beer, are they? Alright. I think I might get involved. I'm frozen from head to toe, after all. <laughs> he seemed like an incredibly friendly man. And when he laughed with his loud voice, as he laughed in a loud voice, he sat down next to Mighty on the couch. Ah, Mikimoto-san. So you're back, are you? Here, I've got your black tea for you. Kobayashi-san brought out some more beer. Ah, he's preparing the tea. Bringing out beer. As he said so, his wife, Kyoko, and the part time worker Midori brought out a teapot and cups and set them on a plate on the table. Haruko, you're. you don't drink beer, right? How do you feel about black tea? We've got some Mississippi mud cake as well. That's delicious. Kyoko asked. And Haruko was lost in thought. Uh, okay, I'll have some then. Ah, feels like I'm coming back to life, Mikimoto-san said. Almost thankfully as he sipped his hot tea. People that grow beards can be hard to discern how old they are. And the same was for Mickey Mottosan as well. Judging from how he spoke, it seemed like he wasn't quite middle-aged, but he was probably in his late thirties. If he shaved his beard, he probably would look around the same age as us. Probably. So, the guests that are staying here tonight? This is everyone, right? Mikimoto-san said as he looked around at us. Uh, no, there's another four people. Ah, hang on. Hmm, there's another four people who are upstairs. Kobayashi-san said. The women upstairs might want some tea as well. Would you be able to ask for me? Sure. The sound of Midori's slippers continued upstairs as she went past the front. What about the man? The kind of creepy man. Turning around to face us once again, she asked. The... I guess she meant the Yakuza type. Ah, Tanaka-san. Alright, well, maybe if you could ask him as well. What? Uh, I don't really want to. If you don't want to, don't worry about it. It didn't seem like he was the type to get, get along with other people in any way. In, in any case. Oh, thank God for that. picked up the phone and dialed the girl's room. So she's not going upstairs, she's going, she's calling in their room. <laughs> Let's see. Well, seems like they want a drink. They told me they'll be on their way down now. Hanging up the phone. She shouted towards the lounge. Mm. Kobayashi-san makes a comment about the type of language that Midori uses. I guess she's been probably being a bit too casual, maybe. 
<laughs> then we can make a comment about it. We could say, yeah, the way young women speak these days, it's just... Huh. That sort of response. Or we could say... Two options are kind of criticizing the way she speaks. That's a bit weird. Let's just go with A, which is. I didn't say anything. <laughs> I didn't say anything in particular. Alright, I'll go and prepare another three cups of tea. Kyoko san said, taking the plate back to the kitchen. Yeah, the service here really is good. Sunset. In any case, the hospitality is what they really like doing. So that's why they started this place after all. Well, he's talking to himself. Kobayashi Sunset. Well, I like looking after people, so that's why I started this place after all. Sometimes it can be hard to tell who's speaking sometimes. <laughs> Three girls came down almost immediately. Good evening. Don't push me, Kanako. I wanted to watch the TV a little bit more. Right away, things have become noisy. Ah, that smells good. Oh, let me just scooch in front of you there. Oh, I said not to push me. <laughs> the number of people had grown. So, I decided to sit on the bottom step of, of the stairs. In any case, the sofa was packed to the brim with people. At nearly the same time, Kyoko brought out some black tea from the kitchen. I tried speaking to Toshio as well, but it seems like he's watching some TV, so he doesn't need any at the moment. Alright, let's drink. Hmm. With the voices in unison. They say, so here they're saying, itadakimasu, which is like what you say before you eat or, or drink something that someone has offered you in Japan. So there isn't really anything like that in English. I guess it's sort of like context sensitive sort of things you can say, but anyway, they're saying that all together, putting the black tea, starting to drink the black tea. It's kind of hard to translate that into English. The cuckoo clock chimes. Everyone focused their attention onto the clock as it chimed. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It was nine o'clock. When the cuckoos stopped chiming, the sound of the snowstorms blew outside. It sounded much louder than the sound of the cuckoo. Frames on the window rattled, and the glass seemed like it would break. I hope there isn't an avalanche or anything like that. Aki, with the glasses, said, as if she was worried. Oh, don't say anything like that, it'll bring us bad luck. Besides, that creepy thing happened before. I don't want to feel any more gross than I already do. And just as she says so, she gasped and covered her mouth. Uh oh. What do you mean by that thing? Mikimoto san said. Hmm, I thought I'd better 
cover for the situation. So we can say, what do we mean by that thing? A is that would be shut up because of the would be kind of trapped in the guest house and die of hunger. Or that there was a cockroach in the soup. Or that someone will die tonight. And there was some kind of threat written that someone will die tonight. So that's the truth. C is the truth. We could mm, we could tell the truth. Or we could tell the truth or we could kind of tell a bit of a white lie. It's not like this tonight. We did talk about dying of hunger. Uh, trapped in the guest house but that's not what the girl was referring to I guess we, we're, just, we're staying on this A path so maybe let's just go with that mm. otherwise maybe the reaction to the truth might be a little bit too intense for Miki to I don't know let's go with A Someone said before that if we were trapped in here with all the snow outside, we'd die of hunger. No way! As if that had ever happened, Mikimoto-san said and laughed exaggeratedly. Kanako turned to M Mikimoto-san to ask him something. Are you from the guest house? Oh, me? No, I'm just staying here. Seemed like we avoided the situation. Mikimoto-san continued speaking. I was late, so I didn't make it in time for dinner. But I guess I should probably introduce myself. There's a lot of young women here, after all. He put down his teacup and kind of, how do you say, uh, brushed himself off a bit, <laughs> kind of revised his stature, that's weird, I don't know, maybe you sat up straight, maybe, my name is Mikimoto Yosuke, I'm a freelance cameraman, I take photos of landscapes, but uh, if someone asks me to take nude photos, I'd be more than willing to do so. Feel free to ask me that, if that's what you want. It seemed like he was joking and he laughed to himself. You, nude photos? The girls looked pleasantly disturbed. <laughs> I'm making fun of it, I think. It's all a joke. Oh, there's nothing to be embarrassed about. Well, everyone has well-formed skin. That's not a weird thing to say. Everyone has tight skin. But, uh... Everyone has tight skin now, but, you know... As you grow older, you'll begin to wish that you had a photo of yourself with that tight skin. That's what I think, at least. I took a quick look at Mari's face. She had a look of pure disdain on her face. I was relieved. <laughs> How about you take a photo, Kana Kanako? Keiko-chan started elbowing Kanako in the ribs. You, no way. I've got no confidence either. Shaking her head violently. It seemed like Kanako just wasn't having any of it. What was that just now? It sounded like glass breaking. Kayama san, surprised, shouted. I'm just going to take a quick look. Kobayashi-san said as he got up 
and disappeared into the back corridors. The enjoyable atmosphere had somehow chilled. Finally, he returned with Toshio, presumably because he'd taken him out of his room. It seemed like there's nothing unusual on the first floor. I'm sorry, everyone, but could you take a look at the windows in each of your rooms? If you leave it as it is, you might return to your rooms and find that it's frozen, like a freezer. We couldn't deal with that, so we got up and headed to the second floor. Arriving at the second floor, we entered, we rushed into our room. Oh, I rushed into my room, rather. There's two beds in this room, which is kind of odd, but... Peering in through the crack in the door, it seemed like there was nothing unusual. But I thought I might as well enter the room and make sure that the window was closed. And then I went back out into the corridor. Mari? The... Kayamas, Mikimoto-san, and the three office ladies all came out of each of their rooms. Looking at their faces, I could tell that it seemed like nothing had happened to either of them. Finally, Kobayashi-san, who was searching the room, the vacant room, also came out into the corridor. Nothing unusual, everyone? So, I guess that means there's only one room left. As he said so, we all looked at the door. I guess it was the room that that Yakuza-type man was staying in. We all crowded around Kobayashi-san. Come to mention it, that threatening letter. Maybe it was him that wrote it. Mari said. What do you mean? Maybe someone was killed in that room. She said to me in a voice so that other others wouldn't hear it. As if. Well, in any case, it's only nine o'clock, right? Even if that threatening letter was a trick, it said that it would be twelve o'clock, right? Yeah, but, you know, most of the time, those kind of... Um, what do you call that? When someone announces a crime, that they're going to commit a crime, usually it's to fool detectives, right? People that are inspecting the case. Wow. You've read Edogawa Dampo, right, Toru? Ah, Edogawa Dampo. I wonder if anyone watching knows who Edogawa Dampo is. Edogawa Dampo is um, the very famous Japanese mystery author. Um, <clears throat> who wrote a lot of uh, kind of Sherlock Holmes esque books, but he was he was very kind of influenced by um, <clears throat> Edgar Allan Poe as well. His name his name is kind of a bit of a play on words of Edgar Allan Poe <clears throat> in Japanese, Ed Edogawa Dampo. and uh, yeah, he sort of wrote a lot of kind of um, murder mysteries. <clears throat> that have kind of strange uh, details 
and uh, a lot of them are sort of very, almost seem kind of like impossible murders. They were kind of pulled off without a hitch, but then the detective, he had a kind of a detective recurring character, like Sherlock Holmes, called Akechi Kogoro. Um, and uh, he would kind of come in and solve the case. So here Marty is, is asking, you've, you've heard of Edgar Allan Poe, you've read his books, as if this, this kind of thing. So pretending, like announcing that you'll murder someone at 12 o'clock, but really that's just to f- put the policeman off, the, you know, set them on the wrong track. Well, I had, but, you know. Uh, excuse me, Tanaka-san. Kobayashi-san said, knocking on the door. He waited for a while, but there was no response. Straining his ears and listening in, you could hear something like wind was blowing. A sound like the sound of blowing wind. hear the sound. Tanaka-san! Kobayashi-san continued to knock on the door. But there was no response. Uh, I guess something did happen in here. I said. Kobayashi-san nodded and put his hand on the door. It's no good. It's locked. Kobayashi san hesitated for a moment, but then he put his key into the lock. The sound of the lock coming undone. Excuse me, Kobayashi san said as he entered the room. But, just as he opened it, something strange happened. From the crack in the door, a terribly cold wind blew. A terribly cold wind blew towards us. From within the room, the sound of curtain flapping and the sound of something being hit could be heard. Tanaka-san! Taking his hand off the door. The door blown by the wind the wall on the other side of the room. We could see into the room. It was the same type of twin room as mine. There were no single rooms in the guest house, so even guests that were traveling alone had to use a twin room. No, the blue in from the open window blew around the wall like crazy. The heavy curtain hung from the window. It seemed as if it was about to tear apart that was blowing so hard. At the bed closest to the window, there was a small amount of snow fragments of glass sprayed along the surface. There was no sign of anyone. Tanaka-san! Kobayashi-san continued to scream as he entered the bathroom near the entrance of the, en- entrance of the room. There was a sound from the window. Turning around, 
the window, which had almost been reduced to a frame. From the outside of the window, something was banging. Maybe he left from the window, I said. Why? Kuberson said in response. I had no idea, of course. It seemed like Kobayashi-san didn't want to look inside the room. Aren't you going to look? I pushed Kobayashi-san. Not actually pushed, but I urged him to search the room. Kobayashi-san nodded slightly, took a few steps forward, and entered to the back of the room. <laughs> Following Kobayashi san, I entered with Mari, and the rest of the guests stayed in the corridor, peering into the room. Protecting my face from the snow and the wind blowing in with my right hand, with, with his right hand, Kobayashi-san reached the window. And just at that moment, he stood upright, stunned. What's this? Drawing closer to him, I followed his line of sight. Between the bed and the window, there was an opening of about 10 centimeters. On the floor, there was something that had fallen down. Something that looked like parts of a mannequin. jutting out from black material. Above that, haphazardly put feet. And near a blue blackish face lay sunglasses. All through the hands and the legs and the torso, there was string, there was a thread. this scene. It seemed like there would almost be a thread between the hands and the feet and the torso. And by tightening and loosening the thread, it seemed like the hands and the feet and the torso would get loose and then tighten, just like a doll, like a puppet. That was the kind of way that the hands and the feet were piled on the floor. What is this? It's... It's a dead body. A human dead body. Kobayashi-san 
almost totally unfazed by the blowing snow, shouted. Both Mari and I were unable to speak. All we could do was stand and look at the body, on which snow had already begun to pile up. Ten minutes later. And that is where we leave it for tonight. On Sounds Like Kaidan Time. What do you think?